soldier stories, letters from wars, past and present. For let me say that your memory is ever dear to me, and that if we never meet again on this earth, I shall cherish the fond remembrance of thee, and think of the pleasant hours past in your society. But let me indulge in the hope that we may meet again ere long. That was by Harry Black, a surgeon of the Civil War. It just, you know, maintains the link that I have with my friends. This happiness is nigh unbearable. Got back from a mission at 4 o'clock this afternoon and came up to the hut for a quick shave before chow. And what did I see? The deacon waving at me as I walked up the road to the shack, a small yellow envelope. This was from Captain George Rary, who was killed in World War II. We weren't to get the letters and we wouldn't know, are we doing the right thing? Should I be home or am I, co am I OK here? I hope everyone had a nice weekend. I just wanted to thank everybody for their messages of concern. It makes us really feel good to know that everybody's out there thinking about me and the welfare of all the troops stationed over here. I know all this Kosovo stuff sounds pretty bad on the news, but know that I'm very safe. From First Lieutenant Schuler, Bosnia. A um, couple, couple of types on the keyboard, and you know you can get messages quick and easy. It's just a lot more convenient. Keeps you happy? Better believe that. What do these letters have in common? They're all from different wars, and some are paper and some are digital. Today on DigitHead, we'll explore how technology has changed the way we communicate and whether technology has changed what we have to say. I'm Susan Shaw. And I'm Chip Kang. And today we're coming to you from the intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum here in New York City. That's right. We want to welcome you to the next edition of DigitHead during this Valentine's Day season. Yeah. We're going to be discussing how our personal communications during wartime has forever changed with the power of the internet and email. Uh, but first we want to welcome our new 300,000 yeah, viewers wow. we got. Yeehaw. Uh, actually, that's what we're up to. But we want to give a welcome to Westfield, New Jersey, and our new partner, yeah. Computer User Magazine. If you want to go check out our website at www.digitheadtv.com and check out some more behind the scenes info. This month we'll be focusing on war letters throughout recent history and how the evolution of email has changed the way American soldiers communicate. Even though personal letters have dropped to less than 4% of all letters mailed, letter writing is having an enormous renaissance over the internet. Millions of people send out email every night. But what about our American soldier? The use of email for soldiers began during the Persian Gulf War, and now there are even field tents set up in Afghanistan for soldiers to email their loved ones every day. In fact, some locations even let soldiers video conference home. That's right. But during World War II, it took a long, long time, even months, for letters to be delivered. It was a tremendous morale booster when it happened. How has the speed of the internet delivery accomplished this better? How has it changed and increased the morale of our soldiers of today? Well, I don't know. Does email convey sentiment or personality the way a letter or card does? With troops from earlier wars feeling that a letter was like a hug and a kiss from home, has technology altered that feeling? And also we'd like to know, how are we going to save those letters for the future? Is all this information going to go out with the next hard drive that you buy? And if you print them out, how do you preserve those letters? Yeah. I mean, today we're going to be meeting some veterans of past wars, as well as the family of a pilot who's currently serving in Afghanistan. We're going to be meeting with Chad Lineweaver from the New Jersey Historical Society, and uh, we're going to see how what you do to go about the steps of protecting the email that you print out and keep. So stay with DigitHead in the Valentine's Day edition. Know that this show is free of the love bug virus, so stay with us, because we got mail. Email will be extremely important to me because I would like for my family to know my whereabouts, that I am alive, and I would like to keep in contact with them to make sure that they are right, to take some of the hardship off of my family. You are getting uh, immediate information, and also, like, uh, you can see 
go to guard instead of waiting for the mail and, you know, delivery and all that. Personally, it would be very important. It would be a great way for me to stay connected with my family, knowing that I'm halfway around the world and away from them. My name is Walter Machura, uh, and it's spelled M-I-C-H-U-R-A. I served in the Marine Corps. I enlisted in the Marine Corps exactly uh, on February the 14th, 1952, which is St. Valentine's Day. I was also discharged on the same day. As a Navy nurse, I took care of the patients, and usually it was on in surgical or medical care. You know, we had fun. We had fun. It was hell. It was hell. But we had fun. You face death every day, uh, not thinking of it in a manner, but it was there. When you left the States, uh, you didn't communicate with your family or any, any of your friends or relatives until you got back. Well, the patients uh, enjoyed getting mail the same as everybody else, which was quite interesting. And you could see their, or feel their disappointment or their lack of being accepted by the, or nobody cares about me. And this could be one reason why I like to write to those kind of people that didn't hear from anybody too often. The word got around, oh, here comes the mail plane. You know, and, uh, and many of the guys would uh, joke around and they would say, uh, yeah, look at that up there in the tail section, there's my letter. <laughs> so everyone uh, looked forward to their, to, you know, for their mail. Praise the Lord, the pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, the pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, the pass the ammunition. And we'll all stay free. Praise well, on V-mail, uh, it was difficult during the Second World War to um, transport and send all this paper. So the uh, government decided to microfilm the letters, both directions, going overseas and coming back from both parties. This here is a uh, V-mail form that the parties would fill out. They'd write the letter and address it and everything, and then that would go through a microfilm machine. And that microfilm would then uh, come out in a, in a letter form when you move frequently, you throw things out so that you don't have any of this so-called memorabilia that is very important for history. 20, 30 years from now, no one's going to show off email messages like you can show off letters today and such. So I think a lot of that history is going to be lost using the email. Remember, the letter is not completed until it is signed and sealed and in, and in the mailbox which is not so with an email. All we had to do was write on top, free. So we didn't have to put stamps on them. So, of course, it was not a, uh, a, a, a money-making thing. We just wrote free on it. And then I can remember, which I thought was very nice, I had seen somebody wrote free, and then under, n underneath it wrote thanks. So after that, I would write all my letters free and put thanks underneath. This is the G.I. Jive, man alive. It starts with the bugle blow and reveille over your bed when you arrive. Jack, that's the G.I. There were no restrictions on what you could put on paper, but there was restrictions on what went through. <laughs> There were 54,000 pigeons used in World War II and 15,000 pigeons used in World War I. That's they quite an increase, that's, so that's it was really obviously neat. very successful. Yeah, very successful. They uh, you didn't always have the ability to, um, to set up telegraph wires. Um, uh, right in the, it was a lot more difficult in World War II to carry, uh, um, to carry radio equipment. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, was, it was a logistical problem mm -hmm. to carry radio equipment. So the, 
So uh, if you had a bird, uh, you could bring a bird in and to carry a mess an important message back. Then it was a lot easier sometimes mm -hmm. um, until until you could establish a communications infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's more instantaneous now. That's the movement is is that with electronics communication, um, with a, with use of an email system, that you can you can write an email and 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 literally get a response back in minutes. Uh, World War II, you sent a letter and it, it could take days, uh, sometimes weeks, before you got the response. You can, you can get feedback more, more instantly, but um, in terms of staying in touch, that's up to the soldier, that's up to the person, um, and how, how much time they have. The most important thing for you at, at any given moment may not be uh, being able to stay in touch with your parents, but over the long term... Well, you have a job to do. Over the long term, that's the, that's the, connection, that's the connection to the United States. That's the connection to the thing that you're that you're there to protect. You know, we've been talking about email and v-mail. We wondered if pigeons would be p-mail, and then somebody says, "Well, no, of course they're airmail." But I wanted to ask you if they had any official name. Uh, there are signal signal core records that refer to them as the U.S. Pigeon Force. Ah, uh, the U.S. Pigeon Force. So that's the USPS. Probably gets there faster than other USPSs. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a mile a minute. Yes, yes, yes. That's how fast yes, the pigeons yes, will get there. Yes. A little bit about our background is that Stephen had been in the Air Force for 10 years and had recently gotten out about a year and a half ago and uh, would enjoy the Air Force so much and the missions of the Air Force that he decided to join the Air National Guard and that was basically his part-time job while he was also a pilot for an air, a national airline and after the events of September 11th uh, he was called to active duty and was activated with the Air National Guard and is now full-time Air Force again and is currently stationed overseas. Now with, with the technology that we have in the electronic mail and uh, we're able to communicate several times a day generally. They have morale computers um, at the location that he's at. There's two of them. There's one in base operations, so if he's actually going to be going into fly or doing any other kind of work, he has a computer there at, you know, to access. There's also another computer in what they would call the family support tent. And just at different bases and locations, they also have family support centers. It's almost a, a renewed feeling just in the emails, just the, the love and the, you know, it's raw emotion. It's, it's um, very touching. It really reaffirms our marriage, even though, you know, we're so far apart. Keep in mind, folks, this, we are interviewing somebody overseas right now. We just sent him a question. He'll be sending us back an answer as soon as he can, mm -hmm. if he can. Hopefully he can. Okay, Stephen answered, um, I'm not going to be able to reply any more email right now. The computer needs to be used for work. He loves me and he'll talk to me later. Have fun. Well, here he, he sent some pictures to the kids. Maybe he we could get the kids. Good. Let me get them and they will go to their inboxes and let me. Isabella, Drew, do you want to ask your dad a couple of questions? Yeah. Oh, that might be daddy. Oops. Excuse me. Sorry. That actually might be Stephen calling. Okay. Hello? Hey, how are you? It's Steven. Oh, great. Good, we just sent you another question. We have um, everybody here from Digithead, and uh, we're having a good time. Bye, love you. Okay, bye. I love you too, bye. I love you too. Bye bye. Daddy was a soldier. He taught me about freedom. Peace and all the great things that we take advantage of. This is my Vietnam. I'm at war. Life. This is Chip Kane for Digihead. We're here in Plainfield, New Jersey, the Queen City. We're going to be celebrating our fourth year shooting this show. What we wanted to do was give you a gift. What we'd like you to do is check out our website, www.digiheadtv. Follow the link 
From there to Galileo Productions at CompuServe.com. Send us an email. Send us your name, your address, what it is that you do for a living, and we'll send you a free mouse pad, free. No postage, no nothing, with a digit head, logo on it, and learn something new. Check us out. Whenever Chip hits the streets of any local New Jersey town, he always seems to stir up computer curiosity as we get a slew of questions ranging from motherboards to modems. This week, Plainfield became the town of questions, and our man on the street, Chip King, had all the answers. What? Where? Is, why? How do you? Where can I find? What recommendations? Why? How you would be able to get? How do you? Why? How do you disarm the device that happens? Um, or why does? How can I? Uh... Better, better ways to prevent uh, viruses through emails, better detection methods. Before you open it, it says hi, blah, 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 you open it and you have a virus. Okay. Better doorways through that. Okay, so that would be the question as to how to protect yourself better. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I think, uh, folks, the, question, the answer on that one always is to know who it is you're getting your email from. You never open an email from someone you don't know. Other than that, a typical firewall, black ice, and some other ones that uh, I can't be too numerous to mention right now uh, are good that are out there on the market, and uh, you should be able to use it. But the most important thing is don't open email from anyone you don't know. Absolutely. Okay? Steve, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a, is a letter written by this boy's mother to him, and as I understand, he was killed, and they returned this to her, and she never opened it. This letter has never been opened on his female, and uh, I, I'm not about to open it either. Uh. Well, we all know how newspaper deteriorates, that we keep clippings, and they yellow, and they crumble, and how many other pieces of paper fall apart as well. And now that we have email, we think, well, we don't have to worry about things like that. But of course, backup systems fail, computers fail, even storage media becomes out of date and obsolete. So today we're here at the New Jersey Historical Society with Chad Leinenweaver, who's director for the library. And we're going to ask him some questions about how you might preserve those really important emails. Now, I know you have a lot of great stuff here, and, and you've brought out some things to show us. Could we take a look? Sure, let's go. I think one of the misconceptions about that people often have with um, maintaining a lot of letters and things that they have is they store them in a shoebox or they have them paper clipped together mm -hmm. or stapled and all those types of things are no-nos. Mm -hmm. You really want to try and preserve paper uh, by itself uh, in, in an acid-free environment. Mm -hmm. As you said, things like newspapers tend to yellow over time. Um, and even newspaper or letters backed up against each other oftentimes rub off or cause um, some sort of residue to come across. You don't want to use tapes or glues or anything like that. Mm -hmm. What you want to try and do is use acid-free paper and acid-free folders. Mm -hmm. And these are things that you can get. There are companies that especially make uh, folders and boxes mm -hmm. that you can store materials in, whether it's letters or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, so it can be maintained for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the paper you showed me, it's very hard to tell whether it's acid-free or not, so you have to really check what it says on the label. Exactly, exactly. If you look at, uh, this is actually a sheet of acid-free paper right here, and this is a sheet of just normal Xerox paper, and there's almost no way to tell the difference aside from a watermark. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really very difficult. So just make sure you know what you're buying before, mm -hmm. you, before you purchase it. Now, I see you have some plastic sleeves. Are, are they actually plastic? Uh, it's actually mylar. Uh, if you're going to, I would say, have something that you're going to be showing a lot or having mm -hmm. people look at, a lot of times mm -hmm. mylar is a better thing to store documents in just because mm -hmm. they can be held on and that way the corners of the paper aren't ripped or torn or no one writes on it by accident. At. Well, I see here you have wonderful letters and things from the Civil War and, and all the different wars so that if people came to the library, perhaps they'd look in the Mylar Ex sleeve. Exactly. Or even just in folders, mm -hmm. too. Um, we often wear white gloves if we have uh, material. Mm -hmm. Even oils on our hands can deteriorate oh, paper after a period of time. Hands. Yeah, and wear, wear gloves or something, just depending on the documents that you may be using. Now, I see you have a lot of other don'ts here that we might yes, take a look yes, at. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, oftentimes, you'll find that letters are stapled together um, or that... Um, 
taped or glued together or paper clips. Rubber bands often deteriorate or stick to the letters mm -hmm. after a period of time after it wears away. So you want to try and keep things free of any of this type of material. Just have the paper itself stored in a relatively uh, low humidity, sort of a, a dry environment and also relatively cool, not right. too warm. And out of the sun and so on and Exactly, so on. in a dark area if possible. Uh. Well, thank you very much. This has been most informative. Oh, you're and we welcome. want Thanks people to by. save those great emails for the future <laughs> generations. Thank you. You're welcome. We're Bravo Company. 1181 Infantry. And, and you're watching Digihead. Well, we've looked at email, we've looked at letters from the past, we've looked at various ways to communicate. Now we're going to look at the future. Uh, I'm here today with Mike Binko from Zybernaut, and he's brought one of the wearable computers that you can just put on and take your computer into the field. Tell us a little bit about the, the history of wearable computing. Sure. Um, Zybernaut, as a company, has been building wearable computers for over a decade. And actually, the first applications were with the U.S. Army. Uh, basically, it was initially used by technicians and engineers and mm -hmm. um, guys out in the field that were repairing Abrams tanks or um, Apache at attack helicopters. And they needed instructions and manuals with them uh, at the at the units that they were repairing, as opposed to back in an office or, or back on the uh, in the tarmac. And technology is changing so fast that they could probably have a couple of 500-page manuals that are throwing out the door every couple of weeks. As you bet. Change. This is really great. So this is a this is a consumer one. Right. This is the latest version of the wearable computer that Zybernaut's developing, and this is called the Poma. And this was designed for consumers. Basically, over the past 10 years plus. Zybernaut has been primarily working with big businesses and helping mm -hmm. them and being more productive mm -hmm. in the field. But, but I, this, know, I know you have an application where telephone linemen go to the top of a telephone pole with a computer on their back and right. use the same kind of technology. Absolutely. And, but this is primarily a communications device. Mm -hmm. it's, it allows you to get out on the web. Okay. This is the head mount display. Mm -hmm. So you put that on your head and what you'll see in there is a full Windows desktop yeah, screen. Yeah, this is great. I see it. It even says shortcut. Here, let's make a shortcut. Here, is this my mouse? That's your mouse. Oh, I see. Uh, Just roll your thumb over here and I see the, the arrow moving around on the screen. This is great. And your buttons left and right buttons. This is great. Right. And basically this is, uh, as I mentioned, a device for mm -hmm. communications and computing. Mm -hmm. So you can do uh, internet surfing. You can check your email, instant messaging. Mm -hmm. Uh, and basically what you see here is a wireless wow. LAN card. Mm -hmm. So you can use the compact flash port to uh, get out to whatever type of connectivity you have available to you. This is really great. This is tiny. I mean, this is really light. Right. This is 10.9 uh, ounces and the head mount is under 3 ounces. Yeah, this is, this is fine. This is great to wear. Uh, so I can go on the net and I can look for our website at www.digitedtv.com and take a look. Oh, this is really great. Oh, and I can do email, too. I mean, this would be a great boon. I mean, I know our soldiers are really interested in email, and they get lots of email, but you could get your email and send email when you're right out in the field, taking your computer with you. This is really amazing. That's the plan. This is really great. So let me see if I can write a letter to my mom. Let me just do some email, send it off. Hi, Mom. This is really a great to send you email this way. Wow. Well, I want to th thank you very much. This has been really great having you uh, on the show and have our viewers see the next technology. So people can go buy this now. But what does this retail for? Uh, $1,499. i got to have one. Does it come in pink? Not yet, but we'll work on it. Great. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Chip? Chip? I can't hear you. Chip? Chip? Are you there? Susan to Chip? Darn. This thing isn't working. Or someone's intercepting my messages to Chip. Speaking of intercepting messages, we sent special commentary reporter Silicon Sally down to Hoboken to find out if she could intercept any interesting email messages from the stars. Here's what she found out. Hey, Digitators. I'm Silicon Sal, the computer gal, and erstwhile reader of the digital pen pal. Aha. OK, so I'm no poet. But this Valentine's Day, folks are getting back to writing old-fashioned poems and other missives to their loved ones and sending them through cyberspace. I've been hacking around here at Lepore's Candy Factory in Hoboken and having some chocolate-covered apricots. But I've been hacking around, and I've intercepted a few love letters on the internet that I thought were especially um, poignant, maybe? For instance, there's this one here. It's a top secret Valentine message that the FBI intercepted going from Osama bin Laden to his 57 wives. It goes like this. <clears throat> I love you, and 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 well, I think you get the picture, right? <clears throat> oh, P.S. I hate America. Well, he's a loving guy, huh? And this one I found from a certain Penelope going to a certain Tom. 
<clears throat> Roses are reds, violets are blues. When we marry, I'll still be Penelope Cruz. Well, I guess that was pretty obvious now, huh? <clears throat> oh, and this one I got hacking around the Jennifer Aniston Brad Pitt website. It's so romantic. <clears throat> Roses are red, violets are blue. You're my best friend, but I want a divorce. This Hollywood marriage is never going to work. You're gay and you know it. I'll see you at my attorney's office. Sincerely, ouch, Jennifer. Wow. <clears throat> I don't know about that, but oh my gosh. Oh, look at this. I got an instant message from a, a secret admirer. Wow. Let's see. Uh, to Silicon Sal, you're quite a gal. <laughs> the sight of you tears me. I need a towel. Oh, man. Um, anything you need, for you I shall travel to anywhere, even Nepal. Around your computer, I'd like to prowl, so write me back and be my valentine. <clears throat> your pal, your secret admirer. Oh, man. <laughs> what am I going to write back? Do I look all right? <laughs> Let me see. Well, oh, I know. <laughs> oh, well, uh, digit headers, I'm going to go. See ya. <laughs> Let's see. Roses are red, violets are purple. Um, We'd like to thank all the war veterans from Long Valley, New Jersey, and also Jamie and her family for sharing their lives, their mail, and their memories. Thanks to Tim Ryder at Fort Monmouth for helping us understand aspects of military communication. And to Chad Lina Weaver of the New Jersey Historical Society for helping us preserve those memories for future generations. We also want to thank you, our viewers, new viewers from Westfield, uh, for keeping on and watching us. We also want you to log on to our website, www.digitheadtv.com. We also want to thank, especially thank, the men and women in the military right now who are overseas helping protect our way of life. Please, if you're all out there, log on to www.digitheadtv.com. I'm Chip King. And I'm Susan Shaw. Safe surfing. Safe surfing. This is Chip King for Digihead. We're here in Plainfield, New Jersey, the Queen City. We're going to be celebrating our fourth year shooting this show. What we wanted to do is give you a gift. What we'd like you to do is check out our website, www.digiheadtv. Follow the link from there to Galileo Productions at compuserve.com. Send us an email. Send us your name, your address, what it is that you do for a living, and we'll send you a free mouse pad, free. No postage, no nothing, with a Digihead logo on it, and learn something new. Check us out.